Um, well, uh, once again, hi and welcome everyone to our CEIH uh, Improvement and Innovation Showcase Series. Uh, my name is Scott Poynton um, and uh, I'll be your host. I work at the CEIH uh, or the Commission on Excellence and Innovation in Health um, as a user interface and user experience developer. Um, and uh, in this series today, um, we'll, we're exploring, uh, and I may be biased, but the very interesting topic of uh, improving healthcare through machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, but uh, before we do um, get started, though, I would like to acknowledge uh, the land that we gather on uh, today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people uh, and acknowledge and respect their deep spiritual connection to country um, and also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region. Uh, and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still important to the living Ghana people today. Uh, and also take the opportunity to acknowledge other lands that people may be joining us uh, from today. Uh, and before we get into proceedings with the presentation, uh, just some housekeeping. Uh, so the presentation is being recorded. Um, and so during the presentation, I just ask that everybody keeps their mics on, uh, on mute, which I think they are by default. Uh, the recording will be stopped for question and answer time, um, so feel free to jump in with your silly questions. <laughs> um, uh, and for Q and A, um, please do keep uh, turn your mics on and your cameras on as well. We want to see your smiling faces, um, but if you don't want to do that um, or don't feel comfortable do it, doing that, you can use the chat function to uh, ask your question as well. Um, for, for those of you unfamiliar with the Commission on Excellence and Innovation in Health, uh, or the CEIH for short, um, we're the lead agency for innovation in healthcare in South Australia. Uh, and we love to bring consumers, clinicians, and other collaborators together to turn ideas into healthcare or better healthcare. Um, and our vision uh, is together, let's create better healthcare for South Australians. Um, and to do this, we um, support the sector to come together to imagine new ideas um, for better healthcare. And we also acknowledge that um, you know better isn't always excellent, but we're committed to measuring what we do um, to make sure that you know what we're doing is is having an impact. Um, so what if the big idea was connecting all of the small ideas? This is the essence of why we host the uh, Improvement and Innovation Showcase series. Really, it's about connecting people um, in South Australia to share their ideas, uh, improvements and uh, innovations, and sometimes all three. Um, and so you may be embarking on the improvement project yourself um, and decide to reach out to Sam uh, later today for a chat. Um, and that's really what, what these sessions are all about. It's about connecting people so they can go on um, to do fabulous things together. Uh, so the showcase series uh, sessions are every Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, for the length of the series. Um, sessions, as I mentioned, are recorded um, and they'll be made available via our website uh, to watch um, after, uh, which is ceih.sa.gov.au. Uh, and we aim to keep these sessions simple um, and share work happening across the sector at, at any stage or level of success. We're not just showcasing uh, work that's complete and ready to be published. Um, and while we do focus on work that's South Australian based, um, every now and then we'll, we'll sneak in and share a showcase that's outside of South Australia, just to kind of spark and ignite ideas. Um, if you have a story to tell, um, please do contact us with your success stories and, and ideas. Um, we want these sessions to be relevant to our audience, um, to you um, and your interests. So if you do have any suggestions um, of topics for future showcase series, we'd love to, to hear those. So feel free to contact us. Uh, so we are um, quite excited to bring uh, this showcase series to you today um, and, and really highlight some of the work, um, some of the excellent work that's happening across the sector using uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence technologies. 
um, essentially to, to sort of augment um, clinical decision making and ultimately improve patient care. So uh, what you're looking at now on the screen is the full uh, program of four presentations. Uh, we've already uh, delivered two and today is the third one. Um, but there is still, the good news is that there's still time to register for next week's session. So if you haven't done that already, um, please do that. You'll find the link uh, in the email that was sent to you. Um, today we'll hear from, um, from Sam. Um, and Sam's going to uh, present on some NLP technologies uh, that are being used to uh, improve patient care. Um, so look, I'm going to stop my uh, stop sharing my screen and stop talking um, and hand over to Sam to do his presentation. So thanks, Sam. Thank you very much, Scott. Now, can you guys see that presentation? Does that come up on your screens? All good, Sam. Yep. Perfect. Um, so look, my name's Sam Glutt. I'm a medical admin registrar in Nowland. Um I want to talk a little bit about me and then a little bit about the project that we have done. It's always easy to start a presentation talking about yourself. Um, I'm a proud Welshman, which makes me rugby, rugby absolutely rugby um, obsessed. Um, grew up in Wales. I was fortunate to be relatively bright at school and managed to get into Cambridge University, where a series of head injuries on the rugby field and probably drinking far too much in the bar after the rugby um, matches significantly impacted on my IQ and um, ability to um, to function at the high level that I was maybe at school. Um, and so I scraped through medical school. Um, I then went to Jersey um, and worked in Jersey sort of as a junior doctor, um, where I was fortunate to be able to become a semi-professional medic and a semi-professional rugby player and um, continued the rugby obsession until I started anaesthetic training in the NHS, where training and playing rugby were not conducive to um, a life in the NHS, which was rather busy. Um, I did three and a half years of anaesthetic training um, in the UK before coming out to Australia for a 12 month sabbatical in 2013 to the Royal Adelaide Hospital to do some intensive care. Uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do ICU or intensive care at that point in my life. Um, and so I um, came out to 12 months of ICU the end of that year, I got offered a job with MedStar and who wouldn't want to fly around in helicopters in a red jumpsuit. Um, and so that was an opportunity I couldn't really refuse. And I think by that point, we were sold on Australia. Um, my then girlfriend had come with me. And at this point, I think we were engaged slash maybe early, early days, day, days of marriage. Um, and we decided that Adelaide was going to be home. Um, so I did a bit, bit more ICU training and then started getting interested in understanding patient outcomes and patient experience. Um, and I'm just a lazy researcher and I wanted easier ways to do it. Um, I was gonna do the research anyway. So I did a PhD looking at how we can use passive data from smartphones to measure patient outcomes um, with the University of Adelaide. And so that was predominantly using STEP and GPS data. And that started to get me interested in some sort of big data analysis. Um, we were certainly getting a lot of data from patients' phones um, when our smartphone apps worked. Um, predominantly they didn't work and so the PhD was overall a failure um, but it meant that I got to learn some learn some Python um, not to the extent to be able to do the stuff that I'm going to present today but um, I certainly have have sort of explored those opp opportunities um, I'm now um, sort of completing RACMA training so Royal Australian College of Medical Administrators um, in Malin Um, but I, I can't really go on without saying we have a Stephen. Um, this is Stephen Backey. Um, Stephen is now an advanced trainee in neurology. Um, Stephen came up to Toby Gilbert and myself. Um, Toby Gilbert is the Divisional Director of Medicine um, in Nalan. We were both working at the RAR at the time. Toby just presented a grand round on how machine learning and decision support for doctors might improve things. Um, we had sort of had chats about this kind of stuff, but we weren't really serious about it. Um, and then Stephen came up to us and said, Oh, I've sort of published 20 papers using um, image recognition for predicting outcomes in stroke. Um, and I, um, I, I'm really interested in what you're doing. We're, we're just about to do a study looking at um, pulling um, ED notes from, um, from the EMR. And I've got a team of six junior doctors who are going to copy and paste those notes. We've got ethics, don't worry. Um, and I was just 
astounded at what he'd done. It's like, well, who's doing your data for you, Stephen? Who's doing all this? And I was like, oh, no, I've, I've taught myself. Um, and now, I mean, Stephen has gone on to publish extensively from a machine learning point of view, but also in ridiculous other fields. Um, I think he has papers on how to operate in space and the impact of student debt. But um, he is now probably in the last 12 months, probably the most published author in South Australia, I think with over 100 papers in the last 12 months. Um, and so is a genius and an enigma, and I'm fortunate to be able to be associated with him. Now, he would love to have been able to give this presentation, um, but unfortunately, he is a junior doctor working in the healthcare system, and we don't give them free time to do this kind of stuff. So unfortunately, um, you have me, um, which means that I don't quite have the in-depth knowledge that Stephen has. I'm probably consciously incompetent, at least, um, whereas Stephen is obviously a bit more of an expert. Um, if that means I have to defer all your questions, um, that's a good excuse to do so. So what's the problem? Well, we know that there's huge variation in length of stay in our hospitals. We This is um, data basically looking at each of the sites and looking at the variation over time regarding length of stay. You can see that obviously there's variation between sites. This is actually um, corrected for complexity of care um, or complexity of the cases on the case mix data. But you can see that there's obviously huge differences between the sites and that there's huge variation within the sites. Um, and this means that some people are probably staying in hospital longer than they need to. And that puts them at undue risk um, because we all know um, the healthcare setting is a risky place for patients. Um, we try to overcome this with things like criteria-led discharge or putting estimated dates of discharge into the notes. This means that the doctors on a daily basis will say, well, I expect this person will go home on this date. Um, and they put those into the notes. Now, often those don't get updated um, or they're just missing totally. Um, and doctors are not great at recording them. And I'll hold up my hand and say I'm one of those. Um, but the idea being that obviously if we can communicate when we're expecting that patient to go home, the whole team can rally around and make sure that we aim for that target. And we know that documenting estimated date of discharge reduces variability in length of stay, and that reduces length of stay overall. So this was the pilot study, and I'll use this really as a bit of an example to talk about some of the things that we did um, before going on um, with the, the three main studies. Um, so can we use natural language processing to predict length of stay? This was in the copy-paste days before we managed to get Stephen access to the EMR backend. And... Um, he copy and pasted 313 sets of ED notes and used it to predict whether someone would stay in hospital for greater than or um, less than two days. Now, this is meaningful to us because if you if we can predict whether you're going to be in hospital for more than two days, it means that you probably wouldn't benefit from going to an acute medical unit and that you should go to a general medical team. And so that's why the greater than or less than two days was used. And so what did we do? Well, we used some natural language processing Natural language processing combines sort of linguistics with computer science. Now, as a dyslexic, I don't really understand the linguistics side of things. Um, and as a medic, I don't really understand the computer science things. But the process is that you segment the text into segments, i.e. look for sentences. You then take word stems. And so you take the prefixes and suffixes um, from those words and just take the word stem. You then tokenize that. So that breaks the sentences into, into words and into stems, and it turns those into arrays so that that's now in a data format that a computer can analyze. And those um, arrays are effectively numbers. And so the computer can now mathematically work out the relationship between all those numbers. Um, we take out stop words. So those are non-essential words because that makes the models quicker to run. Um, and we also take, um, take into account the, the the negation words so not painful and painful obviously opposites and so we need a way to make sure that the um the model um the model is able to distinguish between those two things um we picked an outcome which Hi. was um, or less than two days um now outcome selection yeah is learning yeah. important um you want an outcome that is ideally um a one or a zero you want something that's dichotomous um and ideally you want an outcome that's equally distributed distributed within the data set i.e 50 percent of the patients have the um the event because that makes building a model much more easy um recently i've sort of talked to people about how they want to try and build a model on 
predicting readmission to hospital on um, hospital and the home data sets. And the event of readmission is actually quite low. And so they're really struggling to build their data set because of that deterioration is not often detected or it doesn't often happen. Um, we had a, a relatively good marker in that 30% of patients had a length of stay that was equal to or less than two days. Um, because we had a relatively small data set, um, and this was really a feasibility study, we split it 80, 15, um, 85, 15. Um, and so that's 85% for the training and 15% for the testing. Um, classically, you'd probably want something 18, 20 or 70, 30. Um, but because our data set was so small, um, it was it, we just we needed a sort of a, a, a bigger set for the training set. Um, and then you let your neural net run wild. And so that basically is logistic regression on steroids. And you take um, is all the all the differences between all the different variables and um, work building different biases and then retrain and basically take the models that are the, the best and then move those forward and try to improve them again. Um, and that is my basic understanding of machine learning. There'll be people in this room who are just cringing at that explanation. Um, but um, but that, that's sort of how I explain it. Um, and so to our results, we were able to show that um, we had um, a area under the curve, which is your operating curve, which is sort of how you sort of show the, the ability of your model to predict um, of 0.75, which is okay. It's not perfect. It's not great. One would be perfect. 0.5 is we, we're not able to really predict anything at all. Um, we, had, we deliberately tuned it to be quite specific rather than sensitive. And so sensitivity is the ability for us to detect a positive result. Specificity is the ability for us to detect a negative result. And as we go forward um, and we're looking at discharge, um, we want to be able to predict patients um, we want to be able to highlight patients that are, are not going to be dischargeable in the next two days because we don't want to be highlighting those guys for discharge. And so um, altering our sort of classification thresholds will allow us to, to change the sensitivity and specificity of our model to make sure that we are not, we're going to try and prevent us from highlighting patients that are still going to be in hospital in two days time. Um, when you alter the classification threshold, um, you change what you count as the probability for a positive result. And so you can change that threshold, um, and that allows you to basically calculate the receiver operator curve. And so this is basically the number of true positives that we have versus the number of false positives we have. And as we change that threshold, that probability, a perfect classifier, no matter what you really change, they will all become immediately positive and you won't get any negatives. And so as you then plot your curves, you will find that obviously you want them to be as close to one as possible. And you want to find the point really on this curve where you're optimized um, for, for your model. And so you want to pick a point that's sort of is, is the minimum distance to, to the apex. And so um, predicting discharge, predicting length of stay is always going to be difficult um, because it's not dichotomous, um, it's a continuous variable. And so it's always gonna be a little bit tricky to do. Plus some patients will stay in hospital for four weeks and that has probably got very little to do with what happened to them at admission and probably much more to do with sort of social determinants, but also maybe complications that they've had along their way. And so um, if somebody comes in with, um, I don't know, let's say they've stubbed their toe and they're a little bit delirious, but then go up to a ward, fall over and break a hip, um, that's going to cause major, major problems. Um, when is it really important for us to know that the patient is going to be discharged? And we thought that 48 hours is not unreasonable. So if we can let the teams know 48 hours in advance that these patients are likely to be discharged, then can we predict discharge rather than length of stay? And so we sort of reframed how we were thinking about it. But we also wanted to think about it that as you move through your admission, we're going to be able to build more, more data to be able to say, well, actually, yes, I'm more confident that this person will be able to go home in 48 hours rather than predicting a two-week length of stay on minimal data. So first thing we did was a derivation study. Um, we looked at 
um, basically eight months worth general medical ward round notes. So that was just over 26,000 notes. Um, and 28% of those notes were in a four, within 48 hours of discharge. We then split that as an 80-20 split and used natural language processing to analyze those notes to work out if we could predict whether that patient was going to be in hospital within 48 hours of that note. Um, and that did okay. We got an AUC of 0.8. Um, we've turned the sensitivity down and the specificity up again so that we're trying to make sure that we don't mispredict patients that are still going to be in hospital in two days' time and to tell the teams incorrectly that they can go home. Um, we then went on and did a validation study. And so once you've derived your algorithm um, and you've tested it, you want to make sure that that is valid and you want to do internal and external validation studies. So you want to validate in both the population that you have derived the um, algorithm in and in a different population. Now. You could argue that the Queen Liz isn't that different to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, um, but we will discuss that shortly um, because it is. Um, and so over a four month period, um, prospectively in the RA, we looked at 16,000 ward round notes. And then over a 12 month period at the Queen Liz, we looked back at over just under 20,000 ward round notes in general medicine. Um, and so this is the derivation study results that we have previously um, looked at. And then we look at our validation study. Well, look, the RAR is um, operating relatively the same. I think we've turned up the specificity for these because we were starting to get to points of implementation. Um, but the Queen Liz has a little bit of a fall off. And it, it, it's, I mean, these are the same doctors documenting in the same way in a population that live literally seven kilometers away from each other. And so we were quite surprised that there was still a drop off. But evidently there is, there's a bigger Greek, bigger um, sort of Italian population. So maybe there's something in that. Um, but it just goes to show that you need to be able to derive your algorithms in the population that you are, you, you are working with. Because the bi I, I have no idea what those biases are, but there's some biases that are showing that um, the model just doesn't work as well in the Queen Liz. It's only slight, but it certainly doesn't. Now, we've actually run the same algorithm in New South Wales data, and it performed appallingly, but when we recalibrated it, because they used a more structured note, um, it actually improved um, our ability to predict discharge. So implementation is classically dif difficult. There are very few um, AI implementation studies um, running globally. Um, there's very few that have really ever reported. Um, and so it is tricky. Now, I think one of the things that we've learned here is we didn't really have a way of implementing what we had derived. We hadn't really thought long and hard about that along the way. Um, and so we've now got an algorithm which we've confirmed so we've derived, we've validated it, but what do we do with it? And so um, we could potentially use it to predict how many beds are going to be available in the hospital 48 hours ahead of now. Um, and that might be useful for an executive team. Um, my idea, um, which would have been a total disaster, and I'll explain in a second, was to highlight that patients um, are likely to go home by sending their relatives a text message to let them know that they're probably going to be discharged in the next 48 hours. And we could potentially use it to highlight um, patients' estimated date of discharge, so sort of automatically filling in that field for doctors. Um, that made us a little bit nervous because it became more than just a decision support tool at that stage. Um, but one of our big issues is that we struggle to discharge patients at the weekend. And so we have a fall off on discharge um, at the weekend. And that's multifactorial. Um, but we did wonder about being able to highlight sort of late on a Thursday, um, after the Thursday ward round, the likelihood of a patient going home within 48 hours of that ward round note, um, and whether we could use that data to assist the teams to be more ready on Friday, um, so that we can make sure those patients do get out of the hospital on Saturday and Sunday. Um, and that's what we chose. We went with aiding weekend discharges. Um, so this was the first AI implementation study that we were aware of in South Australia at the time. And it was run at the Queen Liz in general medicine. Um, they have an average patient occupancy of about 70 patients, um, seeing about 10 new patients a day. So they're obviously discharging about 10 patients a day. 
And we wanted to look at whether we were able to, dis to generate a list of patients that were most likely to be discharged within the next 48 hours. Um, we thought about doing that on a Wednesday afternoon um, based on their wardrobe notes on the Wednesday morning. However, that turned out not to be feasible. Um, one, because the wardrobe notes were often not written until late on the Wednesday afternoon. Um, but secondly, because we were predicting patients that were going to be discharged on the Thursday and the Friday. And so we moved it forward to the Thursday. Um, and that then resulted in an email being sent to the teams. So that included the nurse unit managers and the junior doctors to say, these are the patients that are likely to be discharged in the next 48 hours. And so um, it was just a prompt just to get the teams to make sure that they were thinking about getting these patients ready to get them home um, and sort of empowering some of the more junior team members to make those decisions. So here are some examples of what happened. Um, this was a 72 year old um, who was independent of activities of daily living. She had a significant past medical history and she'd presented short of breath. At the time of the prediction, so on the last ward I note, she was day two of her admission. She had a UTI, she had multifactorial shortness of breath, cellulitis and acute kidney injury. And the plan was to chase bloods, discuss with the consultant and then aim home tomorrow. And then the following day, um, she had a ward round. It was discharge home if no acute kidney injury on blood tests. There were no further medical progress notes written and she was discharged um, at uh, 7 p.m. that evening. Um, now, I actually wonder if she needed the bloods to check for her having an acute kidney injury and whether maybe we could have got her home earlier in the day, but the AI was correct. She did go home within 48 hours. Now, one of the first things that we also noticed, which I forgot to say, is that when we first ran this algorithm, the first weekend, the teams were, oh yeah, that one, that one's likely, that one's likely to go home. Oh no, this, this one's really sick. This, we're speaking to ICU about this one. This is a real problem. And we are, why is it predicting she's going to go home? It's because we haven't taken death out of the derivation algorithms. And so we were predicting death relatively accurately, um, but um, probably would have not been good if we'd implemented my idea, which was to text the patient's relatives that their loved one was going home in 48 hours. Um, the second example, which is where the AI got it wrong, and one of the things we've learned from this is that people are very good at being able to point out when it goes wrong. And that's that's great because it starts to get people talking about estimated dates of discharge and then they start filling them in. And that is actually a good thing for patients anyway. Um, and so they, the, the, the non-successful ones are, are also a learning opportunity. So this, again, 78-year-old lady um, with a significant um, past medical history um, who had presented with malaise she, at the time of the prediction, was day six of the admission. Um, she said that she had anemia, cognitive impairment, but states that she complete, com feels completely well um, and feels much better after her blood transfusion. She's very keen to go home as soon as um, he, she can. Um, and then it was to discuss with gastro around the timing of the scope and for an OT assessment. So what actually happened? Gastro were happy to do the scope of as an outpatient, but the OT review was delayed for two days and then deemed not safe to go home, possibly because she had deteriorated further um, from a, a frailty and um, sort of just, just being bed bound in hospital. Um, they then awaited um, a geriatric um, unit referral for two weeks. She spent two days in the geriatric unit before being discharged with geriatrics in the home. And so I have you have to ask yourself, was there an opportunity for her to have gone home at day six of the admission rather than day 20, um, which is when she actually went home? So the learnings. Yep, yeah, look, we've made some mistakes. Um, we were able to re-derive our algorithms and revalidate our algorithms relatively quickly um, to overcome the prediction of people dying rather than going home. Um, but if we had gone with, say, predicting the bed state of the hospital in two days' time, actually being able to predict deaths is, is actually quite useful. And so it really depends what you're using the algorithm for. Um, and I think understanding your problem and understanding what your solution is gonna look like right from the start is really important. Um, 
despite doing all this stuff from an AI perspective, one of the really hard things that we couldn't really achieve with this study is keeping track of which junior doctors are on which teams. So who do we need to email? We have no way of tracking who our staff are and where they are working, especially from a medical perspective. It's easier to email the nums, they tend not to move, but junior doctors move all the time. Um, timing of the algorithm matters, so when we run it is important, um, and being able to, to work that out is, is also key. Um, especially when we get it wrong, it engages people in the process of talking about estimated dates of discharge, and actually that's important. So I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing, but people are very keen to point out where it's gone wrong. And I think that's great. It's there as a decision support tool. It's not there as a, as, um, as a rule. Um, we were able to detect a patient who was very, very unwell. Um, and so maybe that is a future use for some of this kind of stuff. And then, in fact, there's, there's a paper in my inbox looking at exactly this at the moment. Um, the range of patients was often zero but up to four, that's probably, it's probably about where we need to be. Um, we, we're just very nervous about predicting patients that probably need a little bit longer in hospital. Um, but we will, as we gain confidence with this, I suspect that we will, um, we will improve. Um, this often relies on somebody actually pressing a button to run an algorithm um, at sort of 6 p.m., 7 p.m. at night. Um, to generate the emails. Um, now, look, we can automate some of that process and we could even just put that into Power Automate tomorrow and that would be fixed. Um, but allowing this innovation, um, a development space um, before moving it into sort of a production space is important and we really don't have the infrastructure for, for that, um, for us mere clinicians to be able to do this kind of stuff. Um, where is this going next? So we're going to bring this up to Nalan and look at the weekend flying squad. And so we're going to look at predicting discharge both on Thursday and on Friday, creating lists that rank the likelihood of discharge. And so we will then have doctors, um, nurses, um, and OT physio support to make sure that those patients are seen in time. And so we can look at getting them home. Um, and so we'll let you know how we get on. <laughs>